I'm Jamie O'Kane, CPA, Small Business Advanced Tax Planning and Compliance Extraordinaire. And this is the Abundant Beans Podcast, the podcast that takes my love for learning what makes people tick while digging into the good, bad, and ugly of small business ownership. We strive to give you the insight that only those in the trenches of being and working with entrepreneurs can provide. Um, so today I'd like to welcome to the podcast, Sith Kaiser. Stith uh, leads a team of, of consultants to improve the lives of hospital owners, both new owners and seasoned veterans, veterinary hospitals, right? Yes, we do. Um, and their team members enhance client experience, build sustainable practice profitability, and elevate the quality of care for pets. In addition, he does consulting. Um, in addition to consulting, his passion is for veterinary management and extends into the role of managing partner in a handful of veterinary practices and partnering with veterinary friends who are often new to practice ownership and wish to build their legacy. Um, You help, you specialize in staff management, coaching, and financial operations. Man, the fun stuff. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much um, for coming onto the podcast with us. Yes, Um, ma'am, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, Sith and I actually met in person because you um, do some work at CSU. Um, And so I drove up to Hurt Collins and we had some An amazing lunch. Yeah, we went to Pickle Barrel. Um, It was actually funny. So um, I've just been, I'm doing back to back back to back podcasts today, and the guy that I just interviewed, he he also he's at CSU. He's a he's a professor at CSU, and uh, I was like, been to the pickle barrel lately? <laughs> he's like, I have not been back since then. I haven't yeah. been to Colorado since then either. Yeah. But next time, next yeah. January, if I'm back out there for class. I will uh, be dropping in again. I'm all about the pickle barrel. I will drive up again. <laughs> so that and some bourbon, we're good. Yeah, we are in. <laughs> Um, all right, Seth, so what was your first job? I feel bad saying this, having listened to a few of your podcasts now, because everyone leads off with this, but, but I also grew up on a farm. I love it. And uh, when I was nine, apparently I was lazing around the farm. And so uh, my dad and my mom and dad decided it was time for me to, to learn some responsibility. So mm-hmm. Dad actually went out and, uh, so my dad's a veterinarian, he was practicing at the time, but he went out and bought 18 head of cattle and registered Black Angus. So it was the oldest registered herd uh, east of the Mississippi. And he basically said, these are yours, I'll coach you through it, but this is gonna be your job through, uh, through graduating high school. So when I was nine, I inherited uh, 18 head of cattle and, and spent literally until I graduated high school uh, learning how to grow the herd and everything that came along with it. So what did you end up with? What was the result? 68 head. Okay. Yeah, which is tiny, you know, for out west, that's nothing. Uh, I think in Kentucky, our average herd is probably in the low to mid-20s. Oh, wow. um, but, uh, but it was a ton of fun. And mm-hmm. again, listening to some of the other podcasts, I know Bruce did something similar, uh, at least on the crop side. So yes, yeah. you, uh, learned, learned a lot about everything from nutrition to, uh, to, to breeding to, yeah. uh, I remember... I had my driver's permit. I was hauling cattle to the stockyards, uh, terrified being the youngest guy there trying to sell cattle, but learned, learned a lot, a lot of humble pie in there too. Well, I, I mean, I just, I don't know if it really is that interesting, but I think, you know, I'm just understanding the parallels or like how like people get from veterinary to, or from, you know, wherever they are to where they go. And a lot of the veterinary people end up you know, they're from farms, which makes mm-hmm. sense. You grew up with animals, Yes, ma'am. you know, when you find meaning in handling them um so it makes sense it's not something i would have like intuited but it makes sense so can you give us a run through on your career journey i'll try to keep this (laughs) semi-short to cut me off if this gets old no you're good i think it's interesting i I mentioned that my dad was a veterinarian started out mixing animal practitioner and then like like a fair number of mixed animal practitioners they realized after a while that the the lifestyle maybe isn't what they were looking for they get tired of getting you know beat up by horses and and cattle and stuff so he he transitioned to small animal practice and Mm -hmm. ended up just having a few privately owned small animal hospitals and the reason I mentioned this is because like many kids of veterinarians I spent a lot of time when I wasn't on the farm uh scooping poop and doing all the you know all the the typical things that we do when we Mm -hmm. grow up as a veterinarian's parent um and really enjoyed watching him literally start from the back of his truck. I mean, just ambulatory solo practitioner to Mm. being able to have a few hospitals. And even at a younger age, I was enamored less so with the medicine. I I love what medicine does, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for patients and for clients, but I really enjoyed watching him move all the pieces of the puzzle, the staffing, the operations, some of the financial pieces of it. 
Uh, and it was my senior year of high school. We were actually out checking cattle one day and, and dad asked, are you going to try to go to vet school? And, and I told him, yeah, you know, I think I will. I really want to be able to own a hospital someday. And, and I remember it sticks out so clear to me. He said, if what you want to do is, is own a hospital, why go to veterinary school? And that was kind of a pivotal moment for me because I just always had probably the traditional mindset of veterinary medicine is animal science in undergrad. You, you try to get into veterinary school if, you, if, you, if you're lucky. And then eventually if ownership is, is anything in your future, you pursue that. Uh, and, but dad really challenged me and he wasn't trying to talk me out of it. It really challenged mm -hmm. me. You know, if your passion is the people, the management, the operations, why put your th yourself through organic chemistry and all those things uh, to, to go out there and do something you're not passionate about. Mm -hmm. So it's a long story, semi long story short, I love it. Uh, just went to undergrad, got a business degree. And when I was in undergrad, I was doing some, some consulting work for the university and kind of veterinary medicine a little bit fell by the wayside. I knew I did not want to come back to Kentucky and work for my dad, not because of dad, but because I knew that whether I was the best manager or the most incompetent manager, I would always just be Dr. K's son. And I did not want to be just Dr. K's son. Um, so I moved out west to Colorado, mm -hmm. Lakewood, uh, ended up just by half and chance met a veterinarian out there who owned a multi-doctor mixed animal practice. He apparently was very desperate for hospital administrators. He hired me while I was still in school. So I started doing some remote work for him as I was finishing up just undergrad. Then I actually moved out west and, uh, and spent some time working with him. Loved that experience. And one of my big takeaways was trying to staff and retain staff at a multi-doctor for a large hospital. And I was, you're going to laugh at me for this, but I was driving home one night and I heard a commercial uh, for eHarmony, the dating mm -hmm. site for eHarmony. Yes, and, and that day I had been looking through resumes for veterinarians. And it occurred to me at that time that for the most part, in our profession, we are known as we hire fast, fire, slow, and then we complain about turnover and wonder why. And so after hearing that commercial about eHarmony, I thought it would be really cool if instead of just going out and hiring a veterinarian because she or he has a DVM, you actually try to match somebody up based on personality, communication style, philosophies around medicine, mm -hmm. leadership style. So I started a uh, small, as in just me, veterinary matchmaking firm, I called it, uh, called My Veterinary Career. And I did that for about a year. Uh, based out of Colorado, working with hospitals all over the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, loved doing it, was, was ultimately able to add a few people to my team. Uh, I started doing a little bit of speaking in the veterinary schools around career development, so resumes, mm -hmm. cover letters, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And had an opportunity with the American Animal Hospital Association. Uh, they actually purchased that My Veterinary Career business from me back oh. in 2011. Uh, so I started in 08, graduated in 07, started in 08. They bought it in 2011, came on board, brought my team with me. And then I spent about five years working with, with AHA, uh, mm -hmm. both running that My Veterinary Career Division, mm -hmm. as well as kind of taking over their student program at the time. And so spent a handful of years then going into veterinary schools, uh, helping develop and deliver content and curriculum, you know, varied from school to school, whether it was true content or, or curriculum, uh, all around career development, and just all the cool things you can do with the DVM, uh, given my passion for the management, the people side, started mm -hmm. talking about practice ownership. And I quickly realized that I could read a lot about practice ownership and financial management, and all those things, but it's one thing to, to know the theory and the mm -hmm. concept and another thing to actually ap apply it in practice. And, and kind of after coming to that realization, I didn't want to just be the person that just lectured and never had actually done some of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, I was approached by a good friend of mine uh, from a veterinary school who wanted to go uh, buy her own practice right out of school. Mm -hmm. and she wanted to move back to a certain small town where her, her fiance was from. And she came up to me and said, hey, I really want to own a practice. I have no idea about anything other than veterinary medicine. Would you ever consider partnering with somebody mm -hmm. and taking care of all the non-clinical stuff? And I really hadn't thought about that since that conversation with dad that one day but thought, you know what, that would be a great opportunity for me to actually do what I say I'm going to do, which is take all the concept and theory and go see how it plays out in the real mm -hmm. world. So I was still working with AHA. They were gracious and that they let me pursue that opportunity with her. Bought a one doctor mixed animal practice in rural Nebraska, which was a mm -hmm. learning experience, not because of Nebraska, but because it was a rural practice. Mm -hmm. But I absolutely fell in love with getting to work with somebody and help them accomplish kind of their why in veterinary medicine. Mm -hmm. 
really getting to watch somebody kind of go through those different growth phases as a practice owner and watching them take a practice that was certainly could have been run better and, and turn it into something that was barely making ends meet into something that all of a sudden she could build a life for herself and her family, both financially as well as the work-life balance type stuff. That's that so important. Really is, yeah, it, it really is. And, and is, you know, and Jamie, you know this really well, but yeah. right now we talk about the wellness, the well-being stuff. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe because I've lived it myself and I've seen it mm -hmm. that a lot of the answers to the struggles our profession is facing mm -hmm. can be solved through that responsible, sustainable ownership. And I think that's, that was kind of my light bulb moment there. Yeah. Well, and it has to happen, right? Or people aren't going to want to own practices anymore. Right. Right. And, and you know, you and I have talked, you and I talked extensively about that, but this next generation of doctors and the, you know, the ones that are just getting into practice ownership don't want to work 80 hours. They don't want to burn out. They don't want to, you know, have anxiety attacks. Yes. Like they understand that this is a possibility on the back end. So they're changing the game because they want different practices. Yes. Yeah, you're exactly right. And, and when I grew up, and dad was not this way, but but his generation of practitioner, a lot of the folks that he graduated from veterinary school with were that stereotypical, worked 80 hours a week. Mm -hmm. They were divorced because they did nothing but work all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah. They're miserable. They're miserable right. people. Who would aspire to wanting that life? And so uh, to your point, it's uh, whether some people like that ownership mm -hmm. is changing or not, uh, mm -hmm. I think it has to change if we're going to try to keep mm -hmm. veterinarians in ownership opportunities. You know, you know and I always do this, but there's a lot of parallels in the accounting industry and the veterinary industry. Um, I see them all the time. Um, I was at a vet partners meeting back in February and they're talking about, you know, partitioning or, you know, using, you know, vet nurses instead of, you know, or whatever. And it's just like, I just sit there the whole time like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep, mm -hmm. you know, because people don't, you know, people aren't going into firm ownership to work 80 hours a week. You know, people aren't starting their own accounting firms or their own gigs so that they can do what has always been done. You know, we're seeing massive shifts in what work means to people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really, it's really fun. <laughs> it's yes, really, it's, I just, I find it all super fascinating. It is cool having someone with your perspective because mm -hmm. yeah, sure, you're in veterinary medicine, but you had the, the accounting background prior. Mm -hmm. And to your point, where we are in veterinary medicine, you can parallel it to accounting, parallel mm -hmm. to dentistry, human health care. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so in, I think sometimes our profession acts like we're on an island and we're the only ones who have ever been in this situation. And the reality of it is we can learn a lot. I'm not saying that we need to do everything all the other industries have done, no. but we can learn a lot from watching what's happened in other professions. Yeah, and work is evolving for everybody. Yes, ma'am. Especially right now. Y yes, absolutely. Um, so, so what are some of the... Um, that you're seeing, what are the, some of the things that you see that are the biggest factors that drive hospital success? A clear understanding of what the owner wants out of it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of was talking about that one hospital in, in Nebraska, and that was kind of the springboard for me, eventually transitioned out of, of AHA, was able to partner in a few more hospitals. And the reason I mentioned that is because not all hospital owners want the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's one of the, the key pieces of success. So as I was able to partner in a few privately owned hospitals, uh, you know, banks, banks really owning the hospital, we just had our names on the papers. Uh, but, but you get to meet different people and you find out that we get into ownership for different reasons. For some, it is the financial security. Mm -hmm. For some, it is that ability to build their own lifestyle. Mm -hmm. For some, they practice in other hospitals and weren't happy with that level of medicine. And so they got into ownership because they want to practice their definition of, of gold standard. You know, more and more, there's a, the cultural piece of it. You know, an owner, uh, a new owner doesn't want to repeat maybe what they've seen in some other hospitals from a staffing perspective. And so they want to build their own culture. But until we as owners have a clear idea of why we're doing this and what success looks like. I don't think you could have a successful hospital because you end up doing what so many entrepreneurs do. And I know this is true across all, all different industries. Mm -hmm. You do nothing but work in the business. And as you know, as a successful business owner, yeah, that's part of it. But if, if mm -hmm. no one works on the business after a while, uh, the wheels fall off. And I think that's what's yeah. happened a lot in our profession is you get into it. They're passionate about being a technician, not a veterinary technician, but a technician on the, on the veterinary mm -hmm. side. And they don't work on the business. And so they don't ever accomplish why they got into it because they just get into this. I got to keep my head down, power mm -hmm. through every day, see patients. And, 
and they look up 20 years later and the hospital is in the same spot or a lot of times worse off than it was when they started. Yeah. And, um, you know, because we work with a ton of business owners and veterinary practices and things like that, I'm always asking people, why are you in business? You know, what is, Um, what is your business going to give you? What, what is your long-term goal? What do you, you know, what do you want your business to look like in five years? And I like the 10 year one. I, you and I, I think you and I talked about this, but I like the 10 year question. What do you want? Like, where do you want to be in 10 years? Because people will, will dream at 10 years. Right. And so it's just always very interesting to ask people those questions because a lot of people just go into business to create a a paycheck. And if that's why you're there, it's just not going to work. Go work for somebody else, right? If all you want is a paycheck, Mm -hmm. avoid all the headaches of ownership and just go be an associate. And that's not a bad thing. Go be a special, go be an associate, get that paycheck. Uh, So to your point, that's a lot less headache. Give you something, right? Right. It's a lot less sleepless nights. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> I know I've had business owners be like, well, you know, I, you know, think I can earn what I was earning before. And I was like, come back to me in a year. Mm-hmm. If you're still in business and come back to me in a year, because it's just not worth their time, my time. Cause I want people who grow, you know, and see you like what they want so that we can help them get there. Right. Like it's no fun if we're just doing tax returns and rewriting history, right. reporting history. That's not fun. It's not fun for no, anybody. It's not. <laughs> not, worth, <laughs> it's not, not worth it. Not worth the trouble. No, it's just not worth it. It's just like, how do we, how do we help you get there? If, but it, you have to know where you want to go. Yeah. When you're using the how do we help you get there, and I mm-hmm. think thinking about success, that's another key piece. Is mm-hmm. most of the owners that I see that are most successful are people that realize they can't be everything. I'm not a CPA. Mm -hmm. I'm not smart, but I'm smart enough to know I'm not smart enough to be a CPA. And so it's the whole, it's the whole we approach. It's, it's, I think owners that are most successful recognize what they're good at, what they enjoy, and then they find other people to do what they're not either qualified to do, or maybe they're smart enough to do. They just don't love Mm -hmm. doing it, which is where you, it's where hiring a practice manager comes in. It's, Mm -hmm everybody's always heard the old adage, you know, you surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. And that's, right. that's not a novel concept, but a lot of people still don't do it. Yeah. And I, I talk about that all the time. Like, even like with all this cares act stuff coming, coming down, I'm just like, I'm just waiting for the smart people to figure it out and tell me what, you know, what's going on. Mm-hmm. I'm plenty smart, but they're smarter and I know where they are and I know who they are. And I just wait for them yes, ma'am. to do them interpretation. I could read the law. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't mean anything to me. I'd probably fall asleep about three pages. Yeah. In. <laughs> <laughs> but they're creating webinars for me so that I can understand it later. You don't have to worry about it, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pay them to be smarter than me. Yes, ma'am. And I think that's, I think as a, as a business owner, it's totally, it's working in your highest and best. What do you like to do? And what are you good at? And what gives you energy, right? Mm-hmm. And then find somebody else, find other people to do the stuff you don't want to do. Right. And I always say like the best change I ever made to my the best change I ever made to my practice is hiring a virtual assistant. Like what, what was I doing? (laughs) And she was like, how were you handling all of this Mm -hmm. and all of that? And I was like, probably not. Well, well, and that's the thing is that we don't, and I've been there too, right? We we Mm -hmm. think we're doing a better job than we are. And it's not until we finally let go of that piece of control that we realize, wow, maybe I was, (laughs) maybe keeping it together, but I certainly wasn't doing anything as well as I, as I could have been doing had I not tried to do it all. Well, and I, I told people this story all the time. I don't do my own bookkeeping. My bookkeeper that does our client's bookkeeping, she does our bookkeeping, which is my mom. So I get reprimanded about it, <laughs> but I'm just like, it's not, I could use some of my time. I would say if you're spending your time doing your own books, that's time you're not helping somebody else. Right. Like, or I tell people, me, we didn't do our own payroll. I don't do my own payroll. You shouldn't be doing your own payroll. It's too much compliance to worry about. Go give it to the payroll company. That's what they do. Right. I don't want it. You don't want it. Why? Why? Right. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. Um, yeah, even, and I, I, and I use those, I use those, um, examples because people think, oh, the cobbler, you know, the cobbler's making his own shoes or the accountant's doing their own books or whatever. No, I got other stuff to do. (laughs) Yes. That's and a good spot happen. to be. You want to be busy enough where you don't, you're not just sitting around having to do your own books. You got nothing else to keep you busy. Yeah. I mean, I would rather go interview another podcast. You know, I'd rather do that or I'd rather, you know, there's other things I need to be doing with my time. Um, and I think you find, uh, you know, when people really kind of start focusing on that, they really realize, oh, 
that's the thing that needs to be handed over. <laughs> you know, like hiring the VA, like literally she was like, how do you do this? And, and I knew not well, probably. Mm-hmm. Fix whatever you need to fix. <laughs> it's yours. I yeah. don't handle it. <laughs> Even that, you could bottle up that attitude uh, and share it with with uh, yeah. with all of us, myself included. Sometimes yeah. I'm still guilty of doing more than I should at times. Yeah. But that's I think that's one of the keys to success, right there. It is. Okay. I think. But then I'll take stuff back and I'll be like, "Dang it, why did I do that?" You know. <laughs> it's like, and you know, I'm a believer, so it's kind of like that give it to God thing, and then you take it back. You know, we do that in our businesses all the time, and that's normal as a business owner mm-hmm. too. Uh, but then I just like you just have to be aware of yourself enough to be like, oh, this is the thing I keep taking back. Stop, A, stop letting me do that. Like I'll tell my, my people, stop letting me take stuff back because you need to be doing it. Um, and it just undermines our relationship when I take stuff back. Um, but like, you know, you I think if you're in business long enough, you realize, oh, okay, that was dumb. Sorry, I apologize. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and we all do that sometimes, you're right. Mm-hmm. But it's, I think the key is, is like you said, is the, whether it's the emotional intelligence, self-awareness, mm-hmm. whatever term you want to use, it's recognizing when, when we mess up. Yeah. And a lot of us, I think a lot of business owners are control freaks. You know, a lot of us want stuff done in our way. Mm-hmm. Um, so letting go of some of that too. It's like, is it done enough? Good enough? Mm-hmm. That's the thing too. Then you get a lot more freedom. Right. When you're not micromanaging mm-hmm. processes, which guilty all the time because processes are my thing. Um, so what, uh, so we kind of talked about this, but what are some of the things, uh, that practice owners, um, are wanting out of their businesses? I really do think it goes back to, to one of those key things. So as I've kind of moved, I'm still doing some of the the ownership stuff because I love being in it. But now that we've moved to the consulting company, we get to work with a lot more hospitals Mm -hmm. and I get to, to just get a better sample size. But even as the sample size has grown, it still goes back to those things we just talked about, Jamie. It really is. It's, it comes down to the financial security. It's a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. It's quality of care. And it seems like no matter where, where an owner is in the country, where they are in their career, what type of hospital they're in, it almost always boils down to one of those three things. I love it. And that just really helps. You know, they really just kind of, because that's their personality a lot of the time. Yes, I love it. And, you know, you never talked to the, the reason we went to, vet, I mean, the reason I chose veterinary was because of who veterinarians tend to be, you know, what their psychographics tend to be. Uh, mm-hmm. And every time I talk to somebody in the veterinary space, I'm like, yep, mm-hmm, that's why I love you guys. That's why well, it's perfect amazing. for us. You couldn't, you couldn't pay me to get out of this profession. <laughs> I, I could have been in my entire career, most of my life, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and I just, I love the people that are in the profession. They're it's such, awesome. it's such good people. Mm-hmm. Like everybody that has been willing to spend time with me and talk to me and whatever uh, has just been amazing. <laughs> Some of my like most, you know, top favorite people. Um, let's see. So, you know, what, what have some of the biggest shifts been in the last de- decade or so for practices? I guess I've, I've now, I was trying to think a decade. I've been, I've been, that's scary. I've been in this now for over a decade. Uh, so, so I, I graduated in 07, which of course was the, the economy, uh, the, the last recession. So it really yeah. has been kind of interesting to watch trends in with the different hats I wear, I, I see mm-hmm. the trends on the veterinary school and veterinary graduate side, mm-hmm. and then the trends on the practice ownership side. Mm-hmm. And then of course, with that hat on, as well as the consulting hat, you also see trends on the pet ownership side, the whole client experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and there have definitely been a lot of changes over the last, you said the last decade or so. Mm-hmm. A couple, I think very high points. I think our schools are doing a much better job than they did even five years ago actually trying to create career ready veterinarians Mm -hmm. and when i first started so i'm now i've been speaking ever since i graduated but i now get to be adjunct at a couple schools and so Mm -hmm. i I get to be more entrenched which is cool because i get to see a lot behind the curtain now and and i feel like for a long time at the school level we felt like it was our job to make you clinically competent at least enough turn Mm -hmm. you out and either you'll do an internship or you'll you'll figure it out practice you're figuring out either way um and you'll be successful and then Kudos to a lot of the associations, AVMA, AHA. Mm-hmm. They started looking at job satisfaction again, going back to wellness and well-being. And what they pointed out, what probably a lot of us uh, were maybe afraid was happening, that is we were turning people out with the clinical skills that did not have the life skills they needed to, to actually be successful. And so a, a big tip of the hat to the schools over the last couple of years, we are now, not all schools, but a lot of the schools, mm-hmm. 
I mean, when one of the schools where I teach, we, we start talking financial literacy, uh, career development, professional development in year one. Mm -hmm. and, and I know there's, you know, a lot of great articles about financial literacy and just teaching it doesn't necessarily move the, meat, the needle. They have to be able to apply it and you got to mm -hmm. expose them to the right thing at the right time. But the schools think are doing a better job of not just trying to develop that clinically competent veterinarian, uh, but also someone who has the communication skills, leadership skills, the basic financial understanding to go out there uh, and, and be successful. That's so important. And I think it's important for every career track, especially the ones where, you know, a large portion end up being owners at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish we had something like that in the accounting industry because mostly they're just like, you know, turning and burning into like the big four. Cause everybody's like, Oh, you're not going to be in big four. And I was like, I don't want to be in big four. Like, I don't even really know what that means, but no, thank you. You know, because that was just always the, that, you know, we're turning and burning into the big companies basically, mm -hmm. which really isn't the case. A lot of us end up on our own at some point or not, but we have to understand how to be business owners to help other business owners. Well, I think that parallels the, the big four, mm -hmm. not, not we have four big consolidators, no. but again, trends, everybody of course yeah. is talking about consolidation. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the overall roughly 30,000 hospitals, depending on exactly which study you look at, mm -hmm four ish thousand or so are corporately owned and mm -hmm. so to, to your point yeah we're starting to see some of that consolidation and if and i think i think working for a, a larger group can be phenomenal for the, the right person based on what they want out of the profession mm -hmm. but for those that are more entrepreneurial like like me and you mm -hmm. there's still so many opportunities way more opportunities uh so in, in the private practice um mm -hmm. sector and i feel like at times we the industry we, we freak out a little bit about what we see happening with consolidation. Again, I don't think it's all bad anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reality of it is there's still plenty of opportunity on either side of the spectrum there. Yeah, it's, that's really interesting. And I do think that, you know, you know, matching, you know, giving that, letting people know what their options are, mm -hmm. you know, and like whatever you find interesting or whatever, like even when I worked in firms, I was like, well, teach me how to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, teach me how to do that. You know, I go to the admin and be like, well, you're going on vacation. What do I need to know? You know? So I've always kind of been the like jack of all, like show me how stuff works. Right. You know? And it's the businesses that were like, oh yeah, let's do that. Or I'll be like, hey, what if we did this process instead of that one or whatever? And those are the ones that maybe I've always been an entrepreneur, which probably, but, probably, right? <laughs> um, but you know, it's, that's, that's the mentality. And those are the people who need to know that they can own their own businesses. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. You know, or like have the platform to go do that, mm -hmm. you know, which I know that the schools have changed a lot, but yeah, it's been a while since I graduated. <laughs> a couple years. <laughs> it's been a few. Just, you know, just yeah, a few. Just a few. If you're late to that, no comment. <laughs> and yeah, I know. Um, so let's see. What are some of the ways that practice owners um, are growing sustainable practices? So what are some of the tools they're using? Uh, you know, what are some of the you know, up and coming things, you know, how are they building better practices than, you know, have been? Yeah. In the past, I think two big shifts. When mm -hmm. we talk about sustainability, we can't build something if we don't know where we are and we can't measure where we are. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, the, the great trends we're seeing is that I think hospital owners are starting to realize that it's no longer enough to go hang a shingle and write DVM on the door and think you're going to be swamped. Now, sometimes it, that does still happen. Uh, but, but there's, I think we're starting to do a better job of realizing like it's a business, right? But whether you're a CPA, whether you're in veterinary medicine, whatever, at the end of the day, it's a small business and small businesses have to have a profit margin to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot, there's just been a lot more education around understanding that not saying that we all need to go out there as owners and, and be greedy, but it's, it's mm -hmm. understanding that, if, if we don't make money, mm -hmm. we, we're not going to fix the livable wage issue for our support staff. We're not going to reinvest into our hospital. We have no retirement plan. And so I think that, that awareness has helped a lot. Uh, I also think that the profession is doing a better job of breaking free from some of the historical shackles. And COVID, as bad as it's been, mm -hmm. has probably been one of the best things for our profession because it has forced us to just open our mind up. I mean, telemedicine is yeah. not a new thing anymore, but you look at the, the usage right now, the curbside check-in, so many things that we always thought, well, I can never do that because clients don't want it. Mm -hmm. Now we're starting to realize, you know what, as, as long as we're still 
practicing whatever you define as, as, as best medicine, as long as we're still offering clients a positive and memorable experience, we actually have a lot more, I think, flexibility in how we deliver that mm -hmm. than, we, than we thought we did. So to answer your question, I think those that are building sustainable hospitals are actually working on not just in the business, they're learning how to read a profit and loss statement. Mm -hmm. They're learning the story and the numbers. People, I know some people get bored with numbers. I know you and I are not this way. No, but we could do numbers this all day. Numbers for me, they're fun because you can look at a number on a P&L. You can look at an average doctor transaction mm -hmm. and tell so much about the quality of care, the compliance, how they treat their staff. So I think the light bulb is going off that numbers aren't just some dry thing. And if we look at it, we're horrible people because we care about money. Mm -hmm. It's realizing, hey, these numbers tell us a story. And if we read the story and then, then do something different, we have a chance to, to improve our hospital. And then being open-minded to, to how we deliver uh, the care, how we treat our staff. Yeah, and I, I kind of want to go off on a rabbit hole on like money mindset, money mindset stuff, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, especially I find this in women owned businesses, a lot of the time, you know, we do things without understanding that they have value, you know, because uh, we're not really raised to be like, oh, you have, you know, your caregiving or, you know, the emotion that you care, you know, your emotions for your client or the headspace they take up or whatever that has value. Um, and uh, so I see a lot of my money mindset stuff in just business owners, period. Um, but understanding that the money is energy, right? And so I talk to people all the time, like, That's a great analogy, like you that. know, like money is energy. If you, if somebody, if you're giving somebody something, they need to give you something and it, that could be positive or negative. Right. Uh, money's positive generally. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was actually talking to somebody the other day and I, uh, he, I've just been helping him. He's a other. CPA practice owner. Uh, and he's just kind of on an island right now. And he's like, could you just review this for me? I'm like, sure. You know, and then I'm teaching him some stuff on the tax side. And he's like, Venmoed me $400. I'm like, whoa, what is this for? And he's like, don't block the blessing. And I'm like, okay, I won't block the blessing. But yeah. I, and the, but I kind of like turned around for a second. I was like, the thing that the way that I interact with my vendors is that I pay them immediately. Like if I have to put on credit card, I don't care. I pay them immediately because that's how I show them that what they did, that, 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 you know, whatever service they're providing me has value. Like I see that value because I just pay them immediately. They're like, Oh, do you need payments? Nope. Paying you immediately. If I have to pay it off in three months, I'm going to pay it off in three months. Um, because I understand that energy exchange of like, thank you for the thing. Here's your money. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and it's a really easy way to create some good karma with people. Mm -hmm. um, and getting paid and paying your people is a really good way to run a sustainable business. Yeah, people do like to be paid, it seems like. As passionate as they are about the profession, at the end of the yeah. day, it's still, a, it's still a nice thing. Yeah, well, we still have to put food on the, on the, on the table, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not about the actual payment, it's about value for service, sure. right? It's about understanding, oh, hey, because in our world, success is dollars, right? Or value is dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and just a little serotonin boost when I get a check. <laughs> it makes you feel like you did something that somebody... Yeah, yeah exactly. As we think about with this money, what are all the great things I can do for my team, for my hospital, for my family? Like you mm -hmm. said, money is uh, it's energy and, and it should be good energy unless we choose for it to be an evil thing. Otherwise, it, it supports all that we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean... My mom always says evil, you know, money's only evil in the hands of evil. I like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, I actually had a, one of my, one of my CPA mentors first firm I worked in, she would always say, um, if you want to know how God feels about money, look at who he gives it to. <laughs> okay. Huh. And I was like, but Jesus had money. So. Yeah. <laughs> but it was actually really funny. Cause I was like, Oh, huh. mm -hmm. that's an interesting take on that. Yes, ma'am. You know? Sure. Um, so what are some of the biggest obstacles in the industry that you're seeing? Depends on how you want to look at this, Jamie. So obstacles, you could certainly say right now, COVID's an obstacle. Right, and, but it's also an opportunity. And that's that was exactly what I was saying. It's a, it's a mindset mm -hmm. thing. Um, you know, we've got hospitals. So, so I, I know what the published data says, right? Mm -hmm. The published data says hospitals are down across the country on, on mm -hmm. average. Mm -hmm. uh, anywhere from 11% on average to 27% kind of month to date. Mm -hmm. uh, so I get that, but I can also rattle off the names of hospitals in different states, uh, different geographies that are doing really well. Mm -hmm. And I think the 
it, the, the difference is the mindset of, look, COVID sucks. I'm not going to lie. I don't like that the state's mandating that we can't do elective procedures, but I understand why. Mm -hmm. I don't like that I'm having to run split shifts with teams to minimize exposure, but I understand why. Mm -hmm. And so instead of just bemoaning it, it's, it's what you just said, it's looking at the opportunity. And COVID's a blip on the radar, right? We're going to get through this at some point in time. The recession that is, is probably already in the middle of and that's going to be with us probably for a little bit. It's mm -hmm. another blip on the radar, just like the 07 one was. Mm -hmm. I think the people that are most successful are people that are not that bury their head in the sands and say, oh, these things aren't bad. Things aren't going on around me. I'm not, I'm not an advocate mm -hmm. of that. But I think it's looking at the opportunity. A great mentor of mine, you mentioned a few of your mentors, a great mentor of mine a month ago called me and we were chatting and he said, never waste a crisis. <laughs> And that really struck me. And it wasn't like take advantage in a crisis. It was, mm -hmm. if you look hard enough in a crisis, there is always an opportunity. And that's where you see businesses go from good to great. Yeah. I mean, I had a practice open two weeks ago because they came and they did and they were ready. And I was like, do it. And I was like, here's your telemed stuff. You know, like I think, and I was, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, this whole situation has taken these mid to late adopters of technology and change and whatever and forced to them. So you said things are, you know, things are changing rapidly because they have to, right? So they might've been like contemplating telemedicine <laughs> and they probably already knew which one platform they wanted or like they were almost ready to do it, but now they can and they have to, and they're going to be better on the front end, like the back end of all of this. Right. Um, you know, and it's, you know, again, watching the same thing in the accounting industry, all these practices where, you know, the people come in, they do the tax returns and whatever, they've had to completely change the way they do work. And I was like, well, okay, good. I'm glad we had all our systems figured out. Right. Cause we were virtually anyway, but it's just like all this amazing technology and all these different ways to do work. And now people are forced to do it that way, but it's going to be awesome. Like you said, like if you're still taking care of the client and if you're, they're still getting good experience, like somebody was saying that they had a practice, um, a veterinary practice where they were doing the curbside mm -hmm. check-in stuff. And then they were videoing, like they were doing a video, you know, sure. just okay. even on like an iPhone or whatever, just right. a video of the, um, you know, whatever the procedures or whatever they needed to do. And then, you know, they're doing video check-ins later and all of that. And people really like that mm -hmm. because now they, they can take it with them. Yes, ma'am. You know, like they'll be like, what did the doc say about that? Oh, wait, I can just watch the video. Mm -hmm. And it just feels like more continuity of care. Right. Which is really cool. It is really cool. I don't know how I'm going to get my feral cat to the, to the vet right now, but. <laughs> Look at that. Fear yeah. Free. <laughs> Fear free. Yeah. She, uh, it was, she was supposed to do we were supposed to do a three a three week checkup or whatever. I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna get her out from under the bed. Like, I don't have falconer gloves. I might need those. Nah, do that. <laughs> um, do 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 do. Where are we? I don't know. So, so telemedicine. Like, I just kind of want to talk about like these opportunity things. Mm -hmm. You know sure. what we're seeing? Because I just I'm just fascinated. Um, because you said this has been a good thing. You know, COVID-19 is, it's hard. People are scared. Right. But, you know, how do you see it changing the industry? That's what's really interesting to me. Other well, than I'm like really, telemedicine. Yeah, I'm really curious to watch because I think one of the things is going to happen. I think the forward thinking hospitals, which any hospital can be the mm -hmm. forward thinking hospital, is going to look at this COVID experience and say, what did COVID force us to change mm -hmm. that actually has become a new best practice, not hospital practice, but a new best strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's kind of the conversation we're starting to have is telemedicine, curbside check-in, I mean, all these different things. You know, some of these things we've had to adopt to get through mm -hmm. and, and they should be discarded as soon as we're through. Mm -hmm. but, but other things, I think we actually can really integrate into how we practice moving forward. Uh, and I think that's gonna be the real differentiator. Cause some hospitals are gonna do that. And I think some, unfortunately, are going to immediately go back to their comfort zone as soon as the state's no longer saying you have to do these things. Mm -hmm. And that may not be a bad thing. They've been doing it for generations and generations and, and if they're still in business, they're getting by. So, uh, but again, I, I just think that, uh, yeah, telemedicine and telemedicine is, you know, it's a tricky one because some of, you know, some regulations been lifted during COVID, at least around prescriptions, mm -hmm. but, but there's still a lot that needs to be decided by, by higher powers than, than me and you at different levels on mm -hmm. exactly what we're allowed to do, how we're allowed to use it. 
Um, but, but I love what you said about um, even if you're not using a true telemedicine app, and there are some great ones out there, yeah. but using Zoom, like, like we're doing, or using FaceTime, uh, mm -hmm. little things like that, I think can, can continue to add value way after your code mm -hmm. is behind us. Yeah, and it's easy to do, right? Because you're doing it now, and if the clients really like it, then you just continue to do it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I love it. And I think, you know, in this, uh, we're also seeing like the utilization of our, you know, vet net, our nurses, the vet nurses, um, you know, because they've had to do the curbside check in and they've had to, you know, think out of the box and help do all of that. Yes. Uh, which, you know, adds value probably to them too. Oh, I think so. If, I mean, the turnover amongst our nurses is, is, is unbelievable. And a lot of that I'm, I've alluded to the, the livable wage, which is an issue in cities yeah. like Denver and, and a lot of them. It's a huge here. issue here. Yeah. Um, I was like, how much do you pay them? Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. I was like, they could go work at Walmart. Right. More money than that. Right. Well, right now they can get more unemployment than yeah. a lot of hospitals pay them. So, uh, but it comes back to me. The root of the problem is, is probably not a practice owner truly undervaluing her staff as mm. much as it is, with, you know, the average margin, profit margin in a hospital is just under 10%. There's just not much. And that goes back to, again, it wasn't mean to be a responsible business owner. It wasn't mean to be a steward of, of the opportunity you've been mm. given and that you've earned. I think a lot of it comes down to we can't take care of those around us if we don't take care of the business. And they kind of go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yes, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. When we look at the turnover amongst our support staff, a lot of that, when you look at the reasons why, it's either physical, you know, because of, or at least historical handling techniques mm -hmm. or it's because they just feel so unfulfilled because we have certified or credentialed, whatever term you want to use on, on the nurses, uh, being assistants. Uh, I'm amazed by how many hospitals still have veterinarians drawing blood, placing catheters, and I'm all for it. If you need to pitch in and help, pitch in and help. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a hospital, you have doctors doing tech work, and I don't mean that in a derogatory term, but if you're no. a school veterinarian and mm -hmm. you're doing something that someone else went to school to go do, we are not utilizing our staff well, and we're gonna feel that ripple effect on every aspect of our business, from the patient care, to the mm -hmm. experience, to, to ultimately the business itself. Yeah, and I think, you know, in some of this, we can, we can increase utilization. So telehealth can help you increase, tele, you know, that utilization of your nurses. Yes, um, and, you know, cause somebody has to look at the pictures or whatever, you know, when we're, we're using telehealth. And a lot of the telehealth platforms really talk about, like, give this to your nurses. Like here's best practice, yes. you know, because there's a lot of industry people who know how this stuff works. And um, yeah, it's really interesting how, you know, there's a lot of, and it's every business owner, we all do this. We, like I was saying, we all do things we probably shouldn't be doing in our business. Um, we refuse to hand it over. Um, but especially on, you know, this, the very technical doc stuff, it's just like, is this that control thing? And then you just don't have any satisfaction for our vet nurses. Yep. Um, and you're not making enough profit and then can't pay them. <laughs> yeah. You, and, and you and understand you can't pay them unless they're producing, but we have a practice act, right? So in my mind, and one of the biggest shifts we see when a, when a hospital goes from that good to great mm -hmm. is because you look at what, what can your technicians legally do according to your practice act. And if you have a veterinarian doing those things, we need to move away from that. And mm -hmm. I understand it's not just like that. You've got to have the appropriately trained staff. But to me, when you talk about utilizing staff, the rules are spelled out for us. It's, it's not like we even have to guess. You, you go to the rules and you figure out if, if we're not utilizing them, then mm -hmm. what do we need to do as owners to make sure they've got the training, support, the resources mm -hmm. they need to do it successfully. And then if we don't do that, then it's really it's just, it's all, it's our fault that, that we haven't uh, created that better environment. And that more popular. That's really interesting. And I think I told you the story. So a good friend of mine, um, she owns a practice in uh, Texas. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was deciding if I wanted to, do veterinarians. I was like, I, th I think this is the niche I want. I was like, will you like just spend an hour with me? Like, just talk to me about your business or whatever. She's like, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. Um, and like kind of at the end, you know, I was like, so you told me some of your biggest issues are cash flow and you know, all of that. I was like, you know, I just kind of want to troubleshoot that for you real quick. You know, it was like just 15 minutes and she's like, yeah, sure. I was like, so what's your highest profit service? Mm -hmm. Um, and she's like, Oh, surgeries. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, what's your highest profit service that you don't have to do? She was like, oh, uh, well, blood work, geriatric blood work and dentals. Okay. All right. Okay. How come those aren't getting done? Oh, because the techs aren't following up or they're not doing the thing. And I go, why is that not happening? And she's like, oh, excuses, you know, reasons, this, this, that, and the other thing. I'm like, okay, go figure it out. <laughs> I 
I was like, yeah. based on my calculations, you can make five hundred thousand dollars more this year if you or if they were a great one. And again, I know there's the variances in practice mm -hmm. act, but but in, in every state we can utilize our techs better than most hospitals do. Mm -hmm. Uh and yeah, dentistry is one of those great opportunities. Mm -hmm. so I'm not saying that the tech can do it all, but no. Um, uh, yeah. It was actually really interesting. So I was like, I'm gonna check in with you and see what's happening. I was like, go to your practice manager. Mm -hmm. You're like, you tell me you have this rockstar practice, practice manager, tell her what needs to happen, let her implement it. I was like, so like a few minutes later, I was like, so did you do it? She goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I goes, what's going on? She's like, Jamie, oh my God. <laughs> you know, like. Has she she's seen like, the growth? That's the key question. Yeah, so they have. So um, she's like, I fired two techs who wouldn't get on, get on board. She's like, I hired two. I was like into a place where like, cause she already was paying way above market. Cause that's who she is. That's why I love her so much. Um, you know, so they, this amazing job where they get to actually do stuff. <laughs> and she was like, yeah. this is amazing. <laughs> I was like, this just they actually attract good people. Like it's, uh, we're hiring, we're, we're building out mm -hmm. a second room team right now at one of my hospitals. And it's amazing when you, when you offer above market wages. And again, you have to have a hospital hospital that supports that. Absolutely. Which, even in here, a lot of people talk about how tough it is to find support staff. And I agree, it can mm -hmm. be, sure. yeah. uh, but a lot of it also comes down to what we're doing to make somebody want to come work for us. Yeah. Uh, so it was really fun. And I was like, okay, we're doing vets. <laughs> Cause <laughs> this, is, this is fun. You know, it it's, just, fun. it's fun. That's what I love about this. Yeah. It's just so fun. It's just fun. It's fun. I always like to be outside eyes on businesses because it's just fun. Cause like you said, there's stories in the numbers. Yes, ma'am. Um, cause you and I are number geeks, but right. I'm a number puzzle. Works. I'll own it. <laughs> I'm a number puzzle person. Give me some numbers. Let me put it into the puzzle. Tell me what you want the result, the result to look like and let's see if we can do it. You know? Um, all right. So what is the easiest way before I ask my last question? What is the easiest way for people to find you? Ooh, let's see here. So the, our consulting company is Blue Heron Consulting. Mm -hmm. So I've mentioned a lot that, that I've been able to, to be fortunate and in, in, in be able to partner in a few privately owned hospitals. Blue Heron does not own any hospitals. So they're truly separate things. I like all my, almost all the team are veterinarians, practice owners, managers. And so you, you'll kind of see that piece of it. But Blue Heron Consulting, mm -hmm. we do nothing but, but just consult for, for owners. Awesome. Uh, so Blue Heron Consulting is our website. Uh, we're out of Kentucky in case there's another Blue Heron out there, but Blue Heron Consulting, uh, my email, which I don't know the easiest way to get that, but the email is just, it's just S Kaiser mm -hmm. uh, at, at bhcteam.com. Mm -hmm. But the easiest is probably going to Blue Heron Consulting website and, and reaching out from there. I love it. Um, so final question for you. Um, what is the one piece of advice you would give a small practice owner who wants to grow a sustainable practice? Start with why. Start with why. That's a good one. Start with why. I think that that really is where it all begins. Because once you have that, then you can start building it, the framework around that. I don't know where you're going. Yep. Exactly. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steph. Appreciate Jamie, your time thank today. You. Nice to see you. <laughs> thank you so much for listening or watching. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube, iTunes, or wherever you prefer to listen. If you learned something and found some useful information to apply to your business today, please consider giving us a thumbs up and a review. Until next week, be abundant.